The surprise discovery of a gas that could indicate the presence of life on Venus has rekindled scientific interest in Earth's twin planet, and researchers and space agencies around the world are now competing to aim their instruments both on Earth and in space at the planet of clouds. The news dates back to September 14th and is now in the public domain, already commented on Insane Curiosity by another nice video that you can find here. More than a month has passed since that day, and now we want to come back to the subject to better specify the terms of the question, to tell you the reactions of the scientific world, some of them very skeptical, and above all to answer the question that everyone is now asking themselves, namely, Okay, maybe there is microbial life on Venus, but now what happens? How do we confirm it? Let's proceed in order and calmly go through the whole story. It is the week of June 9, 2017. We are on the Mauna Kea volcano in Hawaii, where some of the largest telescopes in the world are crowded at an altitude of 4,000 meters. The James Clerk Maxwell Telescope, a 15-meter diameter radio telescope, the largest ever designed for the study of the universe, through submillimetric waves, is conducting surveys in the atmosphere of Venus, when incredibly the team led by astrophysicist Jane Greaves realizes that the spectrum is showing, despite much background noise, a peak at 1.123 millimeters. The reason of such wonder by astronomers is soon said. To that wavelength is associated the presence of phosphine, that is, a compound of phosphorus and hydrogen that on Venus should not theoretically exist. Let's see why. Phosphine is also a molecule formed by one atom of phosphorus and three of hydrogen, also called hydrogen phosphide. It is a colorless gas, very unpleasant smell and highly toxic. On our planet, it is produced only synthetically and used in agriculture as a pesticide. While in nature, there are only very weak traces of it, almost entirely produced by anaerobic bacteria i.e. that do not need oxygen to live. In putrescent environments such as marshes, animal intestines, guano, etc. It is known, in fact, that some terrestrial bacteria are able to absorb phosphate minerals and oxygen and finally expel phosphine in a process that requires a lot of energy. The reason why they do this is not yet clear, but it is assumed that it may be a waste product or a strategy to drive away rival microorganisms. In other words, there are no known processes in nature that can produce phosphine without the involvement of a large bacterial colony. And this obviously explains the disbelief of the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope astronomers in finding that specific and smelly molecule in the clouds of Venus, a discovery made even more incredible by the measured amount, about 20 ppb parts per billion, a thousand times higher than that found in the Earth's atmosphere. Rather high concentrations of phosphine had already been found elsewhere in the solar system, in particular in the atmosphere of Jupiter and Saturn, but under such extreme conditions of pressure and temperature that it is quite unlikely to meet them on a rocky planet. The fact is so sensational that Greaves has been forced to have all the doubts of the world. Have they done something wrong? Is the background noise too loud? Are those measurements really reliable? A confirmation is obviously necessary, and there is only one other instrument in the world with a resolution that can confirm or deny the observations of the Hawaiian instrument, ALMA, the radio telescope complex located in the Chilean Atacama Desert. But it takes time. These are instruments that have a very busy schedule, and only almost two years later, on March 5, 2019, 44 of ALMA's 66 antennas are able to target Venus. With a clear result, the phosphine peak is confirmed, with the addition of other valuable information. ALMA reveals, in fact, that the amount of phosphine decreases at the poles and reaches the maximum value, 20 ppb, at medium latitudes and at an altitude of about 60 to 70 kilometers, where pressure and temperature are similar to terrestrial ones, and the acidity from sulfuric acid is modest compared to lower altitudes. The resolving power of ALMA is also so great to be able to exclude that in Hawaii they could make confusion with spectral lines very close to that of phosphine, such as that of sulfur dioxide at 
0.121 mm or that of deuterated water at 1.126 mm. And at this point, there can be no more doubts. In the atmosphere of Venus, at a height where temperatures resemble the summer terrestrial ones, there is a huge excess of phosphine. But now we must somehow justify it. That's why Jane Greaves and colleagues, before writing for Nature, the article that would make public their revolutionary result, reviewed any known chemical or geological process that could give reason for the unexpected presence of phosphine. Nothing is left out. Volcanic eruptions, which are still possible on Venus, electrical discharges in the atmosphere, mineral outcrops on the surface, strange chemical processes in progress in the clouds. Nothing. None of these phenomena can justify such an amount of phosphine. The calculations of the authors show, in fact, that these sources, let's say natural, produce phosphine in a drastically lower quantity than the biological action. Someone has proposed that they may be exogenous sources, such as the fall of meteorites from space. Yes, because it is well known that ferrous meteorites contain a particular type of phosphorus, shibersite, that can produce phosphine by contact with water. It is estimated that in this way, they can produce about 10 tons per year, which seems a lot, but in reality is a quantity of several orders of magnitude lower than that found on Venus. Other researchers have advanced the hypothesis that the solution of the mystery may come from the very high Venusian surface temperature, about 400 degrees Celsius, capable of triggering one of the classic reactions for the formation of phosphine, namely the thermal decomposition at about 300 degrees Celsius of phosphites which are transformed into phosphine plus phosphates. On Earth, phosphates and phosphites are the main compounds of phosphorus and are of volcanic origin. There is no reason to think that the past eruptive activity of Venus has not enriched the surface of the planet with these salts. But there is a problem. The Venusian environment is so oxidizing that the presence of phosphites is almost completely excluded and therefore this heat is also a hypothesis to be discarded. At this point, to say it with Sherlock Holmes, once all the impossible is excluded, what remains, however improbable, can only be the truth. So that the authors of the research, having exhausted every possible chemical natural explanation at the end of their article, could not do without, scientists never like to expose themselves with too pop hypothesis, to mention the possibility that the Venusian phosphine may be of bacterial origin that is produced by anaerobic microorganisms that were born on Venus when the surface was covered by oceans up to 1 to 2 billion years ago have progressively retreated to higher atmospheric altitudes when the water disappeared due to the greenhouse effect triggered by the massive presence of carbon dioxide. Although the region of the cloud cover at an altitude of 60 kilometers is one of the least extreme in terms of temperature, it remains very difficult due to the presence of an exceptionally acidic and highly dehydrating environment. But on the other hand, these are conditions that organisms similar to terrestrial extremophiles living in exasperated conditions at temperatures higher than the boiling water or in an extremely acidic environment, even without light or oxygen, could be able to cope with without problems. It's true, concludes Jane Graves in the article on nature, that the bacteria floating in the clouds is a really extreme hypothesis, which can be confirmed or denied, in my opinion. Only at the end of this decade, when we will be able to fly in the clouds of Venus, a kind of airship able to take and analyze atmosphere samples. But maybe we won't have to wait that long. Before seriously considering this possibility, Astronomers will have to make sure that phosphine is really present on Venus. Not everyone, in fact, agree on the data obtained by the Hawaii team. And this is partly due to the fact that so far has been identified only one of the spectral lines of phosphine, the 1.123 millimeter. The most immediate project, therefore, will be to start other observations with other telescopes, such as the NASA Infrared Telescope Facility in Hawaii. The other is the famous SOFIA, a NASA stratospheric observatory for infrared astronomy mounted on a Boeing 747. Observations in the infrared and other parts of the spectrum will allow to look for other absorption lines associated with phosphine, providing a way to definitively verify its presence, 
and can also reveal where phosphine is more concentrated and how its concentration may vary over time. This is true for telescopes on Earth, but what about interplanetary probes? Three missions are scheduled to fly close to Venus in the coming months. The European and Japanese spacecraft Bepi Colombo, traveling to Mercury, the Solar Orbiter of the European Space Agency, and the solar probe Parker of NASA, both traveling to the Sun. The observations produced by these ships would be very important because they would not be limited by the Earth's atmosphere, but their instruments are designed for other purposes, such as the study of the Sun or the surface of Mercury, and therefore it is not clear whether they have the right sensitivity to detect phosphine in the Venusian atmosphere. There is also a spacecraft currently orbiting Venus, the Akatsuki mission of Japan, which since 2015 is studying the meteorological phenomenon and volcanism of the planet. Although it lacks the necessary instrumentation to directly detect phosphine, it could help in the study of the atmosphere. More promising will probably be the missions still under development, those that would still be done in time to modify. The Indian Space Research Organization, for example, is preparing an orbiter for Venus called Shukrian-1, with the planned launch in 2025 and the United States and Europe are also contemplating missions that could provide useful data on the potential habitability of the planet, or even look directly for signs of life. There are also several other missions that are still being studied, which could be modified for this purpose. Two of them, the Da Vinci Plus and the Veritas, could arrive on Venus as early as 2026. The best solution to explore the high atmosphere of Venus would be to send one or more balloons able to resist for a while in the clouds of the planet. In practice, probe balloons capable of analyzing the biomolecules of the atmosphere of Venus. Exactly what the Venus flagship mission provides, a proposal for the long-term study of Venus, its climate, its geological activity, and its atmosphere, which would make use of several elements, orbiter, lander, balloons. A mission, however, that even if approved, will hardly materialize before 2030. To close, we are one step away from a truly revolutionary and completely unexpected discovery, which if confirmed will not only change our vision of the solar system, but could even give us a key to open the doors of extra solar systems. If indeed no non-biological process was able to produce significant concentrations of this gas, then the detection of phosphine in the atmosphere of an extrasolar terrestrial planet could become an almost certain indication of the presence of life at least on a microbial level. And all this is really magnificent.